Turning your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 2 today, and we're going to look at the first three verses of this chapter. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Those of you who know me well know that I am a lover of random trivia. Some of you might call it useless trivia. But one day when my moment comes to be on Jeopardy, my love of learning random facts is going to come in handy. Please pray for my wife, Brittany, as she bears the brunt of having to listen to me share random facts that I've read about. As I enjoy learning about random things, I follow several Twitter accounts that tweet random historical facts on a daily basis. And that might not sound great to you, but that sounds fascinating to me. And this past week, they tweeted a picture of a contract that a certain school district had provided for their teachers for the 1923 school year. And that might sound painfully boring, but please don't tune me out just yet because as I read this contract, I found that the terms of this contract would be considered extremely unusual in our 2019 context. This contract started out with the standard stuff saying that so-and-so would teach the children of this school during the 1923 and 24 school year, and she would be paid $75 a month to do so. But then at the end of the contract, they included a lifestyle agreement that each teacher had to agree to. There are 14 rules, and I'm just going to read some of the highlights to you, and I promise you that I'm not making any of these up. She agrees to the following. One, not to get married. This contract becomes null and void immediately if the teacher marries. Two, not to keep company with men. Three, to be home between the hours of 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. unless she is attendance at a school-related function. Four, and I'm not making this up, not to loiter downtown in ice cream parlors. Five, not to leave town at any time without the permission of the chairman of the board of trustees. Skipping down to nine, she is not to wear bright clothes. Ten, she must wear at least two petticoats. Eleven, no dyeing her hair or wearing makeup of any kind. Twelve, no dresses more than two inches above the heel. I'll stop there, but... Do you think that our convictions have changed in the almost hundred years since this was written? I don't think that anyone regards an ice cream parlor as a den of iniquity anymore. <laughs> I don't think there's anything evil about stopping at the Buckhorn on your, on your way back from Douthat. I don't think anyone here today is wearing two petticoats. And I've never seen a lady get thrown out of church because she's wearing makeup. Convictions change. And when it comes to matters that the Bible doesn't explicitly speak about, that's okay. But then there's another category, and that is things that the Bible is black and white on. There are things in the Bible, whether they relate to what we think about God or how we apply that knowledge to our lives, that are never going to change. For instance, teaching that you can somehow earn your salvation is always going to be false teaching. Teaching that you can simply disregard what the Bible says about God's plan for marriage and human sexuality is always going to be false teaching. And I say all of this to say that you need to clearly understand the distinction between the two categories. The passage that we are going to look at today contains a warning about false teachers. And if we don't grasp this distinction, then we can take these verses and run with them in a way that God never intended. Going to an ice cream parlor does not make you a false teacher. Contradicting the God-breathed scriptures does make you a false teacher. The warning contained in this passage is severe. And so you need to understand right off the bat that this passage is not talking about issues of conscience. It is talking about what has been referred to for many, many years as heresy. With all of that being said, let's pray and ask God for clarity as we look at these verses. 
Would you pray with me that the Holy Spirit would illuminate these verses for us today? Let's pray. Father God, it is such a privilege to come and worship you in several different ways. But Lord, right now, we want to worship you through the preaching of your word. God, I pray that you would be lifted up and glorified by the way that your word is proclaimed. Lord, I pray that you would send your spirit to do its work of illumination in our hearts. God, I pray that your spirit would help us to properly understand these verses. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit. God, I pray that I would just be able to get out of the way and these people could hear from you this morning. God, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's start reading here in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. <clears throat> Starting here, the Bible says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction." And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So if you read the bulletin, you may have noticed that the cover today is not the typical happy scene that Stephanie usually puts on there. She actually showed today's cover to me as a joke this week, and I said, you know what, let's put it on there because it'll show who actually reads the bulletin. So if you've read your bulletin today, you know, that, you know what we're going to be talking about. This verse gives us a warning about false teachers. Verse 1 says that false prophets also arose among the people. Now to understand this, we have to first understand what a prophet is. I was studying some prophecy this week for a class that I'm taking, and I was reading in one of my textbooks about the prophecy that we have in Scripture. And the author was saying that for the average Christian, when we think about a prophet, we think about someone who tells about something that is going to happen in the future. They are foretelling the future. And apparently I'm an average Christian because that's what usually comes to my mind. You might be the same way today. When you hear the word prophecy, you think of future events. But then this author presented some facts about prophecy that really blew me away. Less than 2% of Old Testament prophecy, less than 2% is about the Messiah. Less than 5% of Old Testament prophecy is about the New Testament era that we're currently living in. And less than 1% of Old Testament prophecy is about events that are still yet to come. What that means is that over 90% of Old Testament prophecy is these prophets delivering a word from the Lord that was for right there and right then. Many of these prophets were sent to Israel not to tell them about their future, but to say, you have violated God's covenant and you need to repent. And if you don't, then judgment will be swift and sure. When we think about a prophecy in a biblical context, it seems that it would be best to think about these prophets not simply as someone who is foretelling the future, but as someone who has a word from the Lord. And so as we think about this idea of a prophet as someone who proclaims a message from the Lord, let's bring this into our modern day context. Are there people in the here and now today who have a prophetic ministry? Well, in the sense that God is not giving new inspiration to people, no. We have the complete Word of God, the Bible, and this Bible has everything that we need to live a life that is pleasing to God. God isn't giving any new inspiration. However, is it possible for someone to proclaim a message from God based on what God has said in His Word? I want to be very clear here, I don't think that any preacher should be considered a prophet because God is not giving anyone special inspiration. But in the sense that we can stand up and proclaim what the Word of God says, in the sense that we can deliver a message from the Lord, 
I do think that preachers can follow in the tradition of those who have stood and proclaimed, this is what God says. And when Doug gets up here on Sundays and preaches the word of God, Doug can say, this is what God says. We have God's inspired words recorded for us, and we can proclaim them. And so with all of that in mind, let's think about what this looks like for a false prophet to be in the church. If a prophet is someone who says, this is what God says, then a false prophet is someone who says that, but God didn't actually say that. They are misrepresenting God with their words. They are lying about what God has said. To give you a very well-known illustration of this, just look at the life of Martin Luther. When Martin Luther was born, the church did not allow the Bible to be translated into the language of the common people. And so when the church said, this is what God says, people had no way to know whether or not that was true or false. They just had to trust that person because they couldn't read the Bible for themselves. And as Martin Luther studied the scriptures, he discovered that the Bible is clear that we are justified by faith, not by works. And so one day, Martin Luther hears a church official telling people that they can essentially buy their dead loved one's way into heaven by making donations to the church. And these people had no choice but to trust this official. This representative of the church is getting up and saying, here is what God has said. If you give us money, then your loved ones who have passed away can go straight to heaven. But Martin Luther knew that this guy was a false prophet. And one thing led to another, and Martin Luther was used by God to spark an explosion of truth that continues to this very day. Martin Luther knew that this guy was a false prophet because he could look at what the Bible said and see that it didn't line up. False prophets claim to speak for God, but their message is contaminated by lies. And notice here in verse 1 that Peter says, these false prophets arose among the church. Notice that past tense. This isn't a prediction of future events. This is something that had already happened in the church, and they were dealing with it then and there. As Dr. Davey mentioned last week as he was here preaching We can get so caught up in thinking that we have it worse than anyone ever has. Well, the church has been having to stand for truth for 2,000 years. False prophets aren't anything new. And here in verse 1, Peter writes that false teachers have arisen in the church and writes that they are also going to be false teachers among them. Peter is essentially saying, don't be shocked when you see false teachers start to crop up in your church. You should be expecting this. There will be false teachers among you. Now, once again, please let me be very clear that I am talking about people who pervert the truth of God's word. These false prophets are people who proclaim a message that contradicts what we see in God's word. This isn't talking about simple preferences. If you walk into church and someone's sitting in your favorite seat, that's not the time to say, a false prophet has arisen in the church. (laughs) No, this is describing someone who preaches or teaches a fundamentally different gospel than what is in the Bible. This verse says, it is going to happen. And you don't have to look at the church in America for very long to realize that this is indeed happening. Don't be surprised. This verse goes on to say that these people will bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. Now, this is not the main point of the message this morning, but I do want to stop and say that this phrase is, for me personally, the single biggest reason that I believe in what is called unlimited atonement. This term, unlimited atonement, the word unlimited means that there's no limit on it, and the word atonement refers to Christ hanging on the cross and paying the penalty for our sins. As Christ paid that penalty for our sins, he atoned for our sins. So that phrase, unlimited atonement, means that there is no limit on the payment that Christ purchased for our sins. Now this is, once again, not the main point, but the other viewpoint to this to unlimited atonement, the other side of this coin is that Jesus only atoned 
for the sins of the elect. Those who have been chosen by God for salvation. There are several other verses that I could point you to today for why I believe that yes, the death of Christ did pay for the sins of the elect, but it was not limited to that. But this verse right here has been the biggest as I have formed my own personal positions and it all centers around this word bought. This verse says they even deny the master who bought them. The word that is used in the original language means to buy or to redeem. These people are denying the master who has redeemed them. Now as we look at these verses, it's pretty obvious that these false teachers are not believers. They are teaching a fundamentally different gospel. And yet this verse says that they have been bought, they have been redeemed by the master who is God. So what do you do with this? How can you have someone who has been bought or redeemed and yet deny God and reject his offer of salvation? Well, this is where you have to remember that salvation is a gift. According to this verse, the fact that Christ died for the sins of the world does not mean that everyone is going to accept that gift. What this verse is saying is that there will be those who not only reject that gift, but they will lead others astray as well through their false teaching. And now look at the end of verse 1. It says that they bring upon themselves swift destruction. And this is very, very serious. This is something that God takes very seriously. And this is an incredibly stern warning. This isn't God saying, hey, maybe this isn't a good idea. This isn't a gray area where it's okay to have our own personal convictions. This is a black and white statement from God himself. Those who teach a gospel that is contrary to that found in the Bible are headed towards destruction. Now, there are a lot of messages in the Bible that are full of encouragement. I'll just be honest with you, this might not be the kind of message that will pump you up and leave you walking out of here just feeling great about life. And yet God has put this message in the Bible, and it's a message that we need. Those who preach a false gospel are headed for destruction. Now, it might not look like it right now. There are false teachers who are preaching to megachurches this morning. It looks like they're doing great. But one day they will stand before God and will have to answer for what they preached and taught to others. And the punishment that they, re they receive will be severe and eternal. And yet notice what verse 2 says. The beginning of verse 2 says that many will follow their sensuality. Now right here it might be easy to say, that could never happen to me. I've been a Christian for too long. I know my Bible too well to be led astray by any false teacher. It would be easy to think, I go to Covington Bible Church. Bible's in the name of the church. I could never be led astray. And I'll just tell you quite honestly today, there is not a single one of us here that is above falling for someone else's lies. Towards the end of my time in Bible college, we had devos one night where all of the guys on campus were together for a devotional. One of the staff members there was giving a devotional on being faithful in ministry. And at one point, he gave us the percentage of people that he had graduated Bible college with who were not walking with the Lord. Not just not in a full-time ministry, they had abandoned the faith completely. And this staff member had been out of college for about 15 or 20 years or so. And as a Bible college student, I was shocked by how many people from his graduating class were no longer Christians. And I thought to myself that night, I wonder how many of my classmates will have walked away if I were to look back in 25 years or 50 years. Can I just tell you today, this spring will be four years since I graduated college, and I am already shocked by the number of people who have fallen away completely. These are people who sat under the teaching of the Bible every day by professors who loved the Lord and loved his word. 
We went to chapel together three times a week. We were in church together three times a week. We had devos together twice a week. They split the students up with all the staff for regular prayer together. We were in the Word every day. If anyone could be somehow immune from being led astray, you would have to think it would be a group of people who spent every day studying the Bible. And yet I could tell you the names of people that I went to school with who say that the Bible is a book of fairy tales. I could tell you the names of people who say that the only real God is nature, that we should worship the woods around us and the stars above us. And I could tell you about a guy that I went to school with who had a blazing passion in his heart for ministry. His heart was to go into pastoral ministry and he went above and beyond anything that our school asked of him. He would go out in the community sharing the gospel with people. He purposefully drove 45 minutes each way to church every week because he had found this little church that desperately needed someone to help out. And so he would drive that far to church just to be a blessing to these people. He even spent some time in a foreign country as a missionary. If there was a guy that you could point to and say, this is the real deal, it was him. And today, this guy is a member of a megachurch that is led by a false teacher. And he is bought in hook, line, and sinker. He's always posting on social media about how this guy is just the greatest preacher he's ever heard. He just can't say enough good things about the guy. I can't tell you where he's at with the Lord because I don't know his heart. But I do know that he is bought into some horrible teaching from a real life false teacher. There is not a single person here who is immune from being led astray. And the end of verse 2 says that because of this false teaching, the way of truth will be blasphemed. What a tragedy that these false teachers don't just hurt themselves. They don't just hurt those that they deceive. They hurt the real church as a whole. I've seen multiple times on the news in the past several weeks where they'll mention someone who is a false teacher and they'll refer to them as a prominent evangelical preacher. I thought, wait just a minute. They don't represent me. We are not in the same category at all. And yet so many people's opinions about the church are formed by what they see from these false teachers. The way of truth is blasphemed because of them. Let's keep going on into verse 3. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. This verse gets at the core of what these people are all about. False teachers don't care about you. They care about what they can get from you. Jesus talked about people like these in John chapter 10. I'll just read a few of these verses for you and listen to what Jesus says here in John chapter 10. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand And cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus called these people hired hands. They don't care about the sheep. They care about what they can get from the sheep. They are driven by their greed. With all of these false teachers. You can look at them and their lifestyle. And you can just see the way that they are consumed by greed. And the sad thing is they leave a trail of destruction behind them. Because of that greed. And then notice how verse 3 ends this warning. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. There is a unique gravity to reading a phrase like that. There are false teachers in the world that we live in. It's just the reality that we live with. And right here, the all-powerful God of the universe is saying that these people's condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. There's a few things that we can take away from this. One, look at how this verse says that their condemnation is from long ago. There are men and women today, even as I am speaking to you, proclaiming false gospels. 
Their efforts do not overwhelm the plans of God. God has known from before time began who each of these false teachers would be and what they would say, and he is still in control. And for all of these centuries, there has been a condemnation that is already waiting for them. Notice also that this verse says that these people's destruction is not asleep. It is so very easy to see people flocking to these false teachers by the tens of thousands and get discouraged. It can really take the wind out of your sails to see people get deceived by this. And yes, we should be saddened to see people that are deceived, but don't think for a minute that these false teachers are getting away with anything. They are not and they will not. And the last thing that we need to see from this verse is just how serious this is. If there were some way to verbally underline what I'm saying to you right now, I would love to. But you need to grasp how serious of a matter this is. Truth matters to God. Taking truth lightly matters to God. God is absolutely repulsed by false teaching because it runs completely opposite to who he is. This warning that Peter wrote is just as real today as it was when he wrote it. Now, as I was writing this message this week, the thought that ran through my head time and time again was, how do I connect this message with the people who are here in church today? Because it's so easy to read verses like these and accept them and recognize how serious this is, but sort of not be sure how this really applies to us personally. Because if you're not a false teacher and you don't go to a church that's led by a false teacher and you don't follow any false teachers, then how do you take these verses and apply them to your life? And so today I have three applications that I pray will help you to internalize these verses and help them to really impact your life moving forward. The first thing that we need to keep in mind is that none of us are above being led astray by false teaching. Not a single one of us. You are not too intelligent to be led astray. You are not too mature of a Christian to be led astray. You have not been saved too long to be led astray. There is one thing that is keeping any of us in the faith, and that is the grace of God. One of my favorite quotes of all time, R.C. Sproul said that we are secure, not because we hold tightly to God, but because he holds tightly to us. And so application number one is do not think that you are immune. Do not think that it could not happen to you because apart from the grace of God, it absolutely could. And this ties right in with the second application. And this is that these verses should drive us to the study of Scripture. The only way that you are going to know what is true and what is false is by studying the Bible. It is God's revelation to us. There's nowhere else that has this stuff recorded. You need to know what the Bible says. I've been taking a master's class this semester on how to study the Bible. And one thing that has struck me over and over and over again is that every single part of the Bible is meant to be read. I've heard people in my life say things like, well, I just don't like this part of the Bible, so I'm just not going to read it. Let's be honest, there's not many people who would say that Leviticus is their favorite book of the Bible or the genealogies or the minor prophets. And yet God has given us a book where every word, every single word is from him. And we want to just dip our toes in and spend our whole lives in the same passages. The whole Bible is meant to be read. There is not a single verse that God accidentally dropped in and doesn't really care if you read it or not. Read the Bible. Devote yourself to the scriptures. The Bible has the truth that you need to recognize what is false. Read it. Study it. Become so soaked with the word of God that you can spot a fake from a mile away. 
And then the last point of application that I'll give to you this morning is don't get discouraged. I know that this is a weighty passage and it can be so easy to look around at false teachers and feel like the church, not just our local church, but the church as a whole is heading downhill fast. Don't let it get to you. Don't let yourself be discouraged. The bad news, yes, is that the church has had to fight for truth for thousands of years now. The good news is that no matter what Satan has thrown at it, God's church has remained because at the end of the day, you can do what you want to the messengers, but truth is unstoppable. These false teachers are going to one day receive the judgment that is coming for them. In the meantime, be secure in the promise that Christ will build his church Not just drag his church sputtering into the end of the age. Christ will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And if I could leave you with one more thing, sort of some bonus content for you this afternoon, if you so choose. There is a pastor by the name of Shai Lin. His name is Shai, S-H-A-I, Lin, L-I-N-N-E, Lin. And if you ask me after the service, I'd be happy to give you his name again if you'd like to write it down. But Shai Lin is a pastor who also makes Christian music. And he's one of my favorite uh, Christian artists. And he has a song that is on YouTube called False Teachers. If you go on YouTube and search Shai Lin False Teachers or even just search False Teachers Song, it will come up for you and you can listen to it. I had thought about playing it for you today, uh, but time just does not permit But Shai Lin has a boldness in calling out false teachers that I have never seen in anyone else. So if you'd like, go on YouTube this afternoon, watch it, and let me know what you think. With all of that being said, please pray for Pastor Doug and Dorcas as they travel back this week. And teens, don't forget about the hillbilly hoedown at 5 o'clock. Let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Father God, thank you that your word is truth. Thank you that your word is the ultimate standard for what is true and what is not. And Lord, as we live in a world where there is false teachers, thank you for the promise that we have that you will build your church, that no matter what lies are spread in this world, that your truth will remain. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be lovers of your truth, that we would just immerse ourselves in your word. And Lord, as we were reminded of in communion, God, I thank you that even though there is so much evil, so many lies in this world, thank you that we have the blessed hope that one day you are coming again. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be encouraged and secure and live in light of that truth. And I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. If you have any questions about anything that I've said today, I'll be up front for a few minutes. I'd love to talk to you. Otherwise, y'all have a great afternoon. We'll see you this evening.